All right, so let's go ahead and get started. This is a bit strange. Before we start, this oh, is John Strand. Jordan Drysdale. Jordan Drysdale. Ken Hickler. Eichler. <laughs> Seriously. Really? She calls you Ickler all the time. Well, She's got me doing it now, and I'm your boss. Yes! I'm sending <laughs> your check to I'm some waiting, random person. And next I'm waiting for Kickler, because I haven't changed my email address. Okay, and I'm sense. Sierra. Kickler. So right. we're here for our Cubicles and Compromise webcast. Thank you so much for joining us on YouTube Live. Pardon our hiccups. This is the first time we've done it, but I think it'll be great. So so this is we've got a couple of new things that we're doing, right? So one, this isn't a standard presentation that we've always done. And two, it's a completely different setup. Like we have strange cameras, different lighting styles. The studio is all set up differently, so please bear with us. And uh, if you're listening on GoToWebinar, there should be in the chat a link to jump onto YouTube. And literally, Sierra is going to do nothing but copy and paste that through the entire presentation. All right, so the name of this, this setup, or session, presentation, whatever we want to call it, is actually Cubicles and Compromises. It's based off of Dungeons and Dragons, but it relates to incident response. So uh, we have Jordan, we have Kent, and they have created character sheets. There's passwords which, on those. Which is funny, Whoa. because whenever I said, oh, you guys are creating character sheets, they both looked at me and said, oh, what's a character sheet? Um, so some of you know, some of you don't. Um, but uh, they've created character sheets associated with their organizations um, for this particular game. So this is brought to you by SANS 504, uh, Hacker Techniques, Exploits, and Incident Response, also known as the single greatest information security class of all time, hands down, I think. Quote. Quote. John Strand. That comes from good authority. <laughs> you, right. when you start quoting yourself, that's bad. Like if you're in Kanye <laughs> West territory at that point. <laughs> For I, yourself in the third person. Is it like person. the same as putting your like a, a thought leader? Yeah, that's right. Oh, wait. Thought leader. I should change that and put thought leader. After no, John Strand, comma, thought leader. <laughs> yes. All right. So it's also brought to you by Wild West Hackenfest, the greatest Hackenfest in the West. We will be October 25th and 26th at, uh, it's at the Grand. Grand, the Deadwood Mountain Grand. There are still rooms available. You can stay literally anywhere in Deadwood, South Dakota, and you can walk uh, easily to where the conference is going to be. So there's lots of rooms, there's lots of cool places to stay, great places to eat. Uh, we're bringing back, I think, I'm pretty sure that Dual Core is coming back. I'm not 100% certain, but I believe he is. Don't name names yet because we're still nailing it down, but yeah. there will be awesome people there you won't want to I got into a conversation with Johnny Long, though, uh, yesterday. We were going back and forth. And uh, he's like, uh, what are we doing for the speaker dinner? Like he was basing whether or not he was going to come back <laughs> on the quality of the speaker dinner. The speaker and, uh, dinner will be awesome. Yeah, it's going to be like prime Two rib. Two words. Uh, prime rib. Prime rib. So we'll do that. I don't and, know prime rib. But you know, we're going to push him over the edge with that. I should tell him free beer too. Then everyone's going to be submitting to call for paper. All right. So what if I told you there's actually live action games other than Boffer LARP? And Boffer LARP, for those of you that dated in high school, um, it basically <laughs> involves uh, you build your swords and you put foam around it and then duct tape and you literally run around and hit each other as My though you're goodness. really fighting. Um, yes, there are other ways to actually go about doing things rather than that. So what we're going to do is something slightly geeky. Um, we're going to do this as far as incident response, cubicles and compromise. So why are we doing this though? Well, we do this because a lot of the incident response tabletop exercises that we do at Black Hills Information Security, traditionally for years they were kind of boring. Organizations expected us to come up, come in, go through the incident, and it would get just horrible. Like we'd say, oh, well, let's say you guys didn't detect that. They'd say, well, we'd always detect that. We run Carbon Black or Silence or CrowdStrike or Endgame or whatever. And they couldn't get past that initial idea that they that their security technologies might not miss or might not catch everything. They might actually miss something, and they just couldn't get past that. So every single incident that you would run across with some organizations, it would never be detected, or it would never like go beyond initial detection. It's like, well, our AV would stop that. Well, um, our our firewall would actually stop that on like our extrusion detection. What's leaving the environment? And the games were horrible. And then it involved a lot of like looking up policies and trying to read the policies and the minutia of the policies, and it just sucked. So we decided about, I don't know, nine, 10 months ago, maybe longer, to incorporate 20-sided dice into the scenario. And I don't actually have my 20-sided dice with me, but I have the D&D Quick Dice app. I'm rolling dice on this, I figured there'd be a bit of a problem because it would roll across the floor, it would fall on the floor. We'd have people tripping over cables. You have an app for Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I have an app for Dungeons and Dragons. I also have the complete rules book reference yes. as well. Do we need to go through the rules? Uh, 
Yeah, we're going to go we're through. Gonna, we're going to read that. the entire rule set. Uh, we're going to go through the rules as it relates to this game as well. So the rules are: I'm the incident master. What I say goes. Anything like if I say, oh well, that you can't do that, or you didn't detect that, or whatever, it, it goes right. Anytime there's an action taken by you two, uh, you're, we're going to do a roll, and the success or failure of your action is going to be based on whether or not your roll is 11 or greater, that would be a successful roll. Or if it's 10 or lower, that would mean the action fails. So it's pretty easy, just 11 or greater, 10 or lower. Now there are some modifiers. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of times as your character levels up, there are modifiers for certain activities. So you get like a plus two, plus 10 modifier. Um, and I've added in some modifiers. You get a plus five modifier on your roll if your organization has procedures. And we're doing two scenarios. One scenario involves a company with horrible computer security procedures, and the other one is an organization that's pretty good. And this is based off of some of your history, uh, some places where you may or may not have worked, and also some companies that you may or may not have worked with as well. So they're going to kind of roll with what the procedures they have in place. They also get a plus two modifier if the organization has someone trained in that activity. So some people argue, why do we give more of a preference to procedures than people that actually have training? Procedures are a lot easier for organizations to follow. They can actually go step one, step two, step three. You can give it to ASOC the intern, and ASOC the intern can actually walk through it. Whereas if someone's trained, they may have gotten trained, but they may not have paid attention. They may just be not that interested in computer security. Their just because you have some, their own methodology may be completely different. So I'm giving a modifier, but not really a big modifier for training. There will also be random injects throughout this game, just strange things that happen out of the blue as well. Also, for you two, feel free to ask lots and lots of questions. If you need clarification on anything, you can ask me at whatever you want at any time. And sometimes I may say I can't answer that at this time. That's okay as well. Also, if you're live, if you have any questions, your questions are going to be about 30 seconds delayed on the YouTube streaming channel. And if you want to ask some questions on the mechanics, please hold those at the end and we will address those uh, when we get there. Now the goal is to identify the procedures in the organization that don't exist, some areas of improvement, maybe some technology that they could put in place and some training as well to improve the uh, overall security practice. Now these um, scenarios, we like to go through them relatively quickly. The goal is to do multiple scenarios with multiple different injects rather than just having one scenario that's completely comprehensive of absolutely everything. So let's get started. Monday morning, you guys. So on Monday morning, Help Desk gets a call. And the call basically comes from an end user. And the end user says, I, I got a bunch of these uh, AV pop-ups on my computer system. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So Help Desk took this information and they called you. They said, hey, uh, Susie down in accounting is getting all kinds of AV pop-ups. What do you guys do? She was like, first time, it's sysadmin. Sysadmin. Oh, one, it's sysadmin, yeah. two. <laughs> are we working together or against You guys are working together. You guys are a team on this. What did the AV pop-ups say? So the help desk personnel, whenever you ask them, what did the AV pop-ups say? The help desk, help desk guy says, well, I, I didn't get that from her. She just said they were AV pop-ups. I didn't get any information. I did tell her, however, I did tell her that that she needs to just delete the files. So whenever she got the AV pop-ups, she just deleted the, uh, it said to quarantine, delete, uh, suspend. She just chose delete because that's what I told her to do. Excellent. Okay, well, fortunately, uh, we've got a SIM and uh, our SAT product uh, sends those alerts into our, our log system. So we've got those and we can look them up. Uh, okay. We know what system that's on. So we're going to go ahead and try to turn that system off. Get offline isolated for the moment. Okay, so you're going to isolate the system. Are you guys physically going to isolate the system or are you going to have help desk try to physically isolate the system? Unfortunately, we're not in the same area. So oh. we're geographically <laughs> separated a bit, so it's gonna be a little bit tough, but we're gonna to have to try to work with the help desk to work with the end user uh, to do that. And I don't know if I'd be prepared to power it off yet. I would definitely unplug the network. So I got a question on this though. With your help desk and going to this computer and unplugging this computer or powering it off, do you have procedures for help desk and desktop support to actually go to a system and what they should do for initial incident response, triage, powering it off? Do they have procedures on how to handle this? Well, I tell you, um, in our organization, our help desk staff is very qualified. Mm -hmm. And uh, they know just right off the top of your head what to do. So, but the reason the the, well, I mean, they're understood. 
They're understood. <laughs> so you're not getting a modifier for this at all. But it's understood. I yeah. don't understand. Yeah. No, it's not documented. Uh, you don't get the plus modifier. Dun, dun, but guess what? Dun. It doesn't matter because you guys rolled a 12. Ha! So you guys rolled a 12. So you isolated the computer system, and you were going to go check the sim to try to identify what the malware actually is. Now, are there procedures in place uh, with your security team on how to go and query the sim and look up this type of information, in, uh, AV alerts? Yes, we uh, do take off one of our guys. Uh, he typically doesn't work in that environment, but we have uh, taken him off of his current duties, helping another customer, and put him on searching uh, for those alerts in the sim. Um, he said he did find those alerts. Um, oh, no, he didn't. Oh, he rolled a one. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. He did not find them. Uh, he rolled a one. In fact, uh, it looks like speaking to the to the help desk tech again. Who, uh, Josh says, so our help desk is highly qualified. Highly qualified. <laughs> uh, mind you, mind you. Uh, they are highly qualified. They're so qualified, in fact, before they had the person who the files, they actually unplugged the network cable. So okay, so the system is unplugged. We, we, yes. we, you rolled a 12 on that. So you were successful in isolating the computer system. However, you did not identify the actual AV alerts. You, the, the, the analyst that went and looked it up said, I got nothing. I got no alerts. Nothing from that system. Now that could have been a number of reasons. It could have been that the AV was behind on, on updates. It could be that it was actually off as well, which is unfortunate because that's exactly what happened in this particular scenario. In this particular scenario, now I'm filling you in with a little bit more information of what's going on. The attacker was on that workstation, got local administrator because Sue uh, in accounting was actually a local administrator because she needed to do a scanning checks in and the software that she had required her to be a local administrator. So she was a local administrator. Now, unfortunately, in this organization, local administrator password is widespread. They're not using laps or anything like that to actually change the local administrator password. It's also very easy to guess what the local administrator winter password was. Winter 2001? No. Yeah, it was winter, <laughs> spring 2001. So the password was easily cracked. How, now, how do you already know the password? That's not released yet. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I'm the biggest I'm the incident oh, master. Oh, yeah. I know all, I see all. Didn't you see the cartoon in the 80s? It was right before Rubik's Cube. So this particular attacker was able to pivot and was able to get uh, was able to get domain administrator right uh, was able to get domain administrator on this particular environment however once they did get domain administrator you talked about you had a sim right now as soon as they got on that system they tried to do a volume shadow copy uh, basically pulling ntds.dit out of the volume shadow copy which believe it or not did in fact trip and alert that someone was trying to access the volume shadow copy on the domain controller. So now you've got an alert that says the volume shadow copy is trying to be copied off. What do you do now? Well, uh, it's kind of unfortunate. The help desk staff that saw that alert, um, they actually thought it was a backup related issue and they didn't know that it was a part of an incident handling issue. Wait, so. I'm getting the feeling this literally happened at <laughs> This is starting to feel, this just got too real. real. This just got too real, too fast. So uh, the good news, though, is that the backups did work out OK. So uh, I went to the help desk. Help desk has backup issue. The backup team looked down and said, yeah, backups completed successfully. We have backups. All right, so you do have backups. Yes. So they so they're, thought the VSS which riders is, were triggered by the backup product. Which is awesome, because now you guys have a backup, but then the attackers also have a backup of your ntds.dit file oh, good. as well. But you know what time it is right now? This incident is spiraling horribly, horribly out of control. This is just also, not going well. Eric a, says a roll of one carries forward to a negative two modifier on the next challenge. Yeah, we aren't doing those rolls. <laughs> Thank try you, Eric. Eric's, Eric's a jackass. Um, so you guys try explaining that to CEOs, a negative two modifier on the next roll. All right, so it's time for your inject. Um, so are you a wizard? Yes, yes I am. The inject is the attacker, because now they have domain administrator. They actually posted one of your databases, proving that they've compromised your organization, out on Pastebin. <laughs> He's going to cry. Call legal. <laughs> Call legal. Very, yes. very good. Now, i got a question. Uh, not necessarily something we're going to roll on, but does this organization that you're representing 
Does this organization have escalation procedures in place? Uh, do, are they defined as? Oh, most of you have got the help desk tier one and help desk tier two, and we got a network guy in there somewhere, <laughs> and then it goes straight up to the uh, to the management. Yeah, who's left? C level. Yeah, yeah who's on your shit? Come on, let's see your character straight sheet. to C level. Uh, no, we got HR in there and management. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But those procedures are in fact documented. They are documented, and they are are occasionally enforced. Occasionally, they are enforced. All right, like I said, we weren't going to do a role on that at all. But now but, you're former security professionals. So, but now you're dealing with legal, and now you got to kind of role play legal and management. Now we have Pastebin, right? We've got all this information out on Pastebin. We clearly have malware on the inside of the environment. We now are basically taking two separate actions. Action one is going to be what's the management response uh, for dealing with customers and getting notification out, and then we still have the technical. So we're gonna break this into two separate uh, role plays at this point. So on the technical side, what is your team going to do to deal with this incident uh, from a technical perspective, to manage, uh, from a technical side? Sure, well, understanding that the passwords at this point are basically compromised, uh, especially given the password policy that we didn't discuss. Um, we're definitely going to suggest changing passwords for all users at this point. Okay, and also, suggest. <laughs> suggest. Yes. Also, I mean, that's a good point, right? You're going to suggest because who ultimately is going to be making those decisions on the actual actions that are going to be taken? It's going to be the management. It's going to be management at this point. Very good. Okay. Very cool. What if we, what if we block pace bin? <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, that might work. <laughs> Somebody put it. We block right. pace bin. Problem solved. <laughs> uh, if we can't see it, it's not a problem. Just put your head in the sand, your ass in the air. It's going to be okay. Uh, and um, Jeff wants to know, are they documented on paper and in the invisibility? No, they are documented <laughs> digitally with <laughs> digital <laughs> signatures. But equally invisible. Um, <laughs> all right, so from the technical side, you guys are going to try to get authorization from management to change all of the passwords in the organization. I think that that's an interesting approach. But you still have malware on the environment. So how are we going to identify the malware on the environment? Baseline DA accounts, per my policy. Who's DA and who's not? Okay. Oh, DA policy, okay. Uh, see who's domain administrator. What exactly would you be looking for if you're gonna be looking at who's domain administrator and who's not? Outliers. Outliers, very, very cool. Um, also remember we have a similar, just to kind of nudge thing, we have a similar that's an account tried to access ntds.dit in the volume shadow copy. What could we possibly do with that? Assume that was a compromised account. There we go, there we go. All right, so let's check and see if we uh, actually detected that. You rolled a 14, and you were able to identify the domain administrator account that was, in fact, compromised, uh, which is great. Um, so based on doing the DA but policy, yes. what if we installed Norton Internet Security? Or Kaspersky? Kaspersky. Kaspersky. Easy. Minus, Easy. Minus 10. Oh, no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. Uh, we're not going to be ripping on our AB brethren much anymore. So you guys identified the <clears throat> account that was compromised. So now what are your next steps? You've identified the, the compromised account. What are, your, what are your next steps for this one? Well, we also want to be able to identify the ingress, try to figure out uh, how the system was. Okay, so we're going to go back and we're going to look at the system, correct? Yeah. So we got the account. What system is that account okay, actually on? Forensics. Very cool. So if you guys are going to look at the egress and what's leaving the environment, um, what uh, procedures and technologies do you have in place that will assist you in actually identifying that egress traffic that's leaving? Are we looking at company A or company B? We're still in the bad company. Okay. They're really so bad. So fortunately, company. the uh, unfortunate company uh, did have uh, a decent firewall system that reported those types of things to the SIM. However, uh, we were able to find the, the ingress traffic and the egress traffic going back out. Okay. Now, I got a question. Um, do you have NetFlow on these firewalls? Like the SIM's going to point and say, hey, there's something funky here. Is there actual NetFlow data that you can pull off of these firewalls? Unfortunately, there's not. There is not. So we only have an alert. Yeah. Okay. But we did at least get an alert of where the traffic was going. So we at least have that IP address of where the evil traffic is going. So what would be the next steps in this organization? If we have an external IP address where data is going outbound to, um, what would you guys do for the next step after you identify the external IP address? Well, we still have malware that's in the system that we need to get taken care of. So now that we had a, that path uh, figured out where the ingress and egress was, we need to look at getting that system cleaned up. Okay. 
um, after we've analyzed it. Great, let's stop right there before we do too many steps, okay? So you're gonna analyze that workstation to identify what IP address it's communicating to outside of your organization. Uh, do you have anybody trained, are there any procedures for doing live Windows forensics on that workstation to identify what network connections are currently being made? No, we do not. You do not have those procedures. Pause, Anyone? pause, pause. Yeah. Let's just call Black Hills Information no. Security. Don't, we don't do incident <laughs> response. Uh, go to rendition. God, go to anybody else, <laughs> um, please. Uh, so. Josh said that was what we should do. I like it though. I think we should kick some ass and uh, However, take a name or two because that's what Brian Boitano would do. We do have an excellent resource, Google. You have Google? Yeah, yes. We do. So we're going to uh, Google how to, how to, how to do that. Last world 100 sided dice. <laughs> yes. yes, congratulations, <laughs> successful. This is right on the line. You guys rolled an 11 with no procedures at all and like no training. You guys were able to identify the IP address that it was connecting out to from the SIM. You were able to identify the executable that was making that connection outbound from your organization. All right, very good. What's the next step? Uh, for us, we need to get that system operational again so we can get that system back up and going. However, uh, we do know that the uh, Active Directory domains are getting compromised in some fashion, so we've got the passwords being changed there. So we're starting to get to a, a little bit more comfortable of a place. Okay. Um, Review filtering. What, do what we, are we filtering outbound? Do, do we have we check or IP yeah. filtering? So I, I think that that's interesting. Is there any way at all that your organization can get any type of connection data that's leaving the environment associated uh, and instead of the SAM? Is there anything that you can do to try to see, are there any other systems that are connecting outbound to this particular IP address? Unfortunately, there's not. Uh, we use our, our SIM and we rely on it heavily. And, uh, and only and, the SIM. Uh, yes, unfortunately. In SIM we pray. <laughs> In SIM we believe. All right, so uh, the next step is going to be what then? We've named a whole bunch of things. What's your next next step? Filter. Outbound. We're going to filter the outbound to that IP address? Yep. Okay, so in this situation, that was successful. So the attacker only had one command and control server. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you rolled a 19. Uh, so that means that you were successful in actually blocking all the traffic going to that bad guy's uh, computer system. All so. Right. So we're going to kind of table the technical side of it right now. Let's go back to the management side, right? Let's go back and let's talk a little bit on this paste bin issue that's right behind me. Uh, we have sensitive data, highly sensitive data posted on the paste bin. You've brought in management. You brought in legal. In this sample organization that is horrible at computer security, what do you think that this organization is going to do insofar as like managers? One guy yells up Bill and says we should disable every account until the password's changed. Okay, so let's check and see if all the passwords were changed. Yes, all the passwords were successfully changed. You guys are doing great. That's right. That's <laughs> That wasn't the way I wanted it to go, no. <laughs> but you changed all the passwords, this but we still... This company is succeeding! <laughs> in spite of itself, because at the end of this, they're going to say, clearly we have no problem. No problem at all, because we rolled fine. 18. Um, this is fine, right? This is all fine. So now the question is, um, we, we've got two issues. We still have sensitive data online. How are we going to handle this organization? Pace bin and the sensitive data that's online. Well, we've spoken to legal. They said they're going to be drafting a document to uh, Pastebin directly to They rolled a six. They failed at drafting the document. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's no modifiers. He's going to keep rolling until he gets a four. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> He's going to draft, uh, draft a request to Pastebin to have the data removed. Yes. Okay. And, uh, Were roll, passwords changed to 15. default? So you rolled a 15? Passwords, the passwords, the passwords were all changed to change me, one, two, three. <laughs> let so, me in. Let me in. Yep. Now, let's talk let about the PR in. side. Let's talk about the PR side. How would this organization that you guys are representing, how would they handle it from, from a public relations perspective? Uh, how about we fire the ISO? Someone's got to take the hit. Uh, uh, contact marketing. See wow. what they think. Dun, dun. Hand this over. I'm so glad that Sierra doesn't. <laughs> it's it's nice that you think we have an ISO. Uh, uh, you know. This company does. We're, we're not playing as BHIS. Well, let's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's you, right? I'm not anything <laughs> at all. Um, so let's talk this through. So, if we're handling this from an HR disaster perspective, what are some right ways and wrong ways to handle an HR problem like this? It's vis a vis your customers and even your employees. Pay off the bad guys. <laughs> who, who are different we? kind of <laughs> ransom? Yeah. 
Oh, that was a shot. That was a shot. Um, how about Tim says download a copy from Basement, sanitize it, submit to GitHub. <laughs> They're full of all the good Don't ideas. Don't ever listen to Tim. <laughs> ever. Under any circumstances. We're going to take this hacker and make it completely public. <laughs> um, I would have a question in what state uh, the business exists. Unfortunately, this is in South Dakota. And in what oh, state? So we don't have to report school. And also, what state all the clients are in? Um, unfortunately, I think all of you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the company that you're representing, all the clients are in South Dakota. Great. Correct. And yes, and uh, if I recall correctly, there was no medical data uh, that was also released after reviewing this. Is that, is that correct? Yes, there was no medical data. There was, there was no PHI that was released. As um, this. I actually just got a call from legal. Okay. Uh, who says, don't worry about notifying anyone. Uh, and they're working with, uh, they're working with PaceBits. Let's see how that works. You rolled a one. <laughs> did, don't did, believe me, did, it's did, right did, there. Did. We rolled a one. The users, uh, not, not the users, but your employees uh, and your customers saw that this data was in fact on PaceBit. And now you have customers that are calling you direct, directly and demanding how you guys are going to deal with this data. So your cover up of it, did not work to the surprise of no one. You guys roll great, except when it matters. <laughs> All right. Son of Bill 62. Okay. Uh, uh, Polish resume? Polish resume. 15. Congratulations. You're successful in getting uh, a new job. job. You're, you're successful in finding a new job, and this is no longer your problem. No. Okay. All right. So if, if we're moving through this, uh, we have users that are now complaining. How do we get ahead of this story? Well, we're definitely going to work with the PR team, and uh, we have a PR team. We do now because we had to hire one externally. Oh, fair. <laughs> Appreciate that. PR suggests that you should get up and admit what you did and apologize. Oh, great! Oh. PR is now speaking. Let's see how that works. In the great state of South Dakota, it works, but barely rolled a thirteen. Hey, that's more than barely. That's and two points I, above barely. I also, I also know that in the state of South Dakota, your your customers have. No other options whatsoever, <laughs> and we're going to close out this incident. All right. So now let's back up uh, for a couple oh, seconds. That was yes. beautiful. At the end of this, at the end of this, surviving. At the end of this, uh, we 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 now want to say, okay, what went wrong here? And I think that systematically there was a lot of things that went wrong. Uh, first, the procedures exist, oh. but it doesn't sound like they're actually uh, clearly. Um, they're not actually clearly communicated with staff, right? And I'm also guessing that you guys were blowing smoke. Like, we have a very well-trained help desk, <laughs> an outstanding help desk. And so I, I would say that if we're looking at procedures, if we were doing this for a customer, we would have marked out um, incident handling procedures for live Windows forensics, right? Uh, the SIM analysis procedures uh, for actually how to go and look at a SIM. And I also noticed there was an astounding lack of training uh, in this organization. I think there's Months, these, admin. It's a fantastic training. I have so those. many certifications. I yeah. don't need training. Yeah, security 504, I which is, know everything. Which I is literally, which is literally the only certification you will ever need. All right. So someone said we should sell our stock first. Sell our stock, and then we end up in jail for before contacting legal. So. Yeah. No, 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 there's no evidence that they knew about the incident mm -hmm. before they actually showed, sold all their shares. So I, I think this is basically a full rewrite of the procedures. All joking aside, this organization had little to nothing in the way of actually handling computer security. Uh, they had some technologies in place, they had help desk in place, but I think they were relying on the skill set of um, people that worked on help desk to get them through the incident as a whole. It's worth noting, I think they thought they were very secure. They did think that they were very secure, but unfortunately the only thing that saved this organization is that they were in south dakota and uh, they had no reason to actually notify uh, what's the name of that bill that's coming up it's senate bill 62. senate bill 62. which is not looking no it's been shelved right now it's been shelved it's been getting pushed and pushed and pushed and we'll probably get pushed to the end of session and get it, so. yeah great so we, the credit card companies hey, don't on want the plus side josh changes. says this company had user awareness because they did call the help desk they did in fact i think that that's actually a really strong point uh but once again, does this, was that because of this user, or was that because there was user awareness training, or because user awareness is in the news now? Yeah, true. Absolutely, you can't let you can't let Fox News be your. Meg Nano says they were counting on a tool to save them, and the tool did not uh, in this situation. So, so let's that, go to our other company. Let's go to the other company. Now, this is a completely different company. This is actually a representative of one of the recent tests that we did, where the company was really, really, 
really solid in what they were doing. Um, so this is going to be completely different. The first one, it sounded like there was a whole bunch of, oh, crap, we don't know. We're going to try to pull these things out of our butts. Uh, this next company is representative of a very solid company uh, that has very good security, and I actually have a scenario that's designed for them. So this one is pretty easy. Friday at 4.55 p.m., your company's main web server is defaced with a fluffy bunny. Probably Dude. marketing fault. <laughs> it's probably marketing's <laughs> fault. That's a cute bunny. This so one is this one's a lot more fun because I know what actually happened. They better find out. All right. So step one. Reboot exchange. Reboot exchange. That was successful. They rolled a sixteen, and yet it had nothing to do with the incident. The server whatsoever. Still <laughs> the web server is in fact still compromised okay. after rebooting. Um, we have contacted marketing uh, to let them know there's a fluffy. Bunny? Love yes. you, Bunny. Sort of looks like a bunny. I've never seen. Really All right, so now here we go. So marketing went to the website, and they said everything is fine. They opened Ooh, up the website. Cash copy. And, oh, okay. It could be a cash. Uh, could be DNS. Yeah. So what are you guys going to do? So we know that marketing looks at the website, and everything looks okay. Marketing is in a different city uh, than the actual IT security team. But the IT security team is going to this website, and it is, in fact, a fluffy bunny. Can you not yet. <laughs> We're going to look at DNS. We're going to look at DNS. Yep. All right. So you look at your local DNS records, and all of your local DNS records mm -hmm. are um, actually. Josh said success. a bunny is not really a defacement. It was a clown. <laughs> <laughs> so you rolled an 18, and you notice that your actual DNS cache locally, everything seems to be just fine. But the internet's. The internet. So, okay, so how would we find out how the internets are working as it relates? For those of you that don't know, DNS is kind of like the phone book. It resolves names of websites like blackhillsinfosec.com to an actual IP address. So how would you check DNS remotely? Well, we're going to want to check uh, where the authoritative name server record is uh, for our website because it may have been changed or not authorized. All right, so do you guys actually have procedures for actually discussing this incident with your um, with your ISP, with your DNS provider, is actually having procedures. Absolutely. You do have documented procedures for them. Um, so you rolled a seven on that, but guess what? You have procedures. Plus five. Plus five, we'll so that it. means it works. So you actually contacted your, um, we're rolling, 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 and I'm bringing up Limp Biscuit. I am so very, very, very sorry for invoking the, uh, the Fred Durst uh, here. The 90s were actually- Rolling, 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 isn't that Kid Rock? No. I'm really no, happy. No. There's, dude, you just got a raise. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow, that's all that took. All right, so we try rolling again. Yeah. Yeah. Being an idiot in pop culture. Yeah. Well, specifically Limp Biscuit culture. It's very, it's very advantageous to be an idiot on that um, as well. All right, so you guys contacted the uh, provider and uh, your DNS provider uh, said, "Wait a minute, you guys actually faxed us in a DNS change request form." Uh, this morning, and we're propagating out the new DNS record across all of our DNS servers right now. With good fortune, we use GoDaddy, and that happens practically instantaneously. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> good fortune. Such a bad decision I made like <laughs> 10, 15 years ago, and we're still paying for it uh, to this day. All right, so, uh, oops, I gotta stop doing that one. So you rolled a set of team, and they were able to actually set the DNS records. However, it's time for an inject, right? Um, ASOC, the intern, in the middle of this incident, uh, decided that the web server was down. He heard from somebody that the web server was down. And he believed that the way to restore a website was to go and revert it to snapshot. So right in the middle of working through this incident. Ken's having a hard time. <laughs> Just decided to revert this thing uh, to, 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 to a snapshot. Unfortunately, he didn't revert it to the most recent snapshot, which would have been like the, the previous day and everything would have been just fine. He went and found the oldest snapshot. So somebody said, because <laughs> he thought he heard somebody say, you need to revert it to the earliest snapshot. But he took that to mean the earliest in time. And he reverted it. And this is literally not something I'm making up. This actually happened to one of our customers. And he reverted it to snapshot, and the web server actually was reverted to a snapshot with a backdoor called hello.php on the web server. And the, the, the facement is taken care of. You've got that. But as soon as you revert it to snapshot, now you're getting alerts.
that there's a reverse shell coming out of your web server going to Kazakhstan is nice. Well, you Very know what nice. We should do, Josh thinks, we should send the intern to the help desk. We should send the intern to the help desk. <laughs> We're rebooting things is a lot less dangerous. We, we know that snapshots aren't backups, right? Yeah. Okay. But unfortunately, he stalked the intern. Did not. Did not. <laughs> no. Okay, so snapshots are temporary states of time. They are absolutely temporary, temporary states of time. Nothing more than delta of file. Yeah, but uh, look at I it. I think that uh, maybe... Look at it. It's <laughs> like a, he's like a baby Mr. Bean. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should lose points because someone gave the intern too much access. Oh. oh wow. That's hard, what though. That's hard, though, right? Boy. I mean, like with a lot of these socks and knocks, it, it's literally a crash cart connected to a server. <laughs> and... You bypass or in somebody's them. basement, yeah. yeah sitting in logs basement. prompt. Yeah. That's a video. It's okay, Mark. All right, so next step, what are we going to do here? <laughs> uh, check backups. Check backups. Do we have legit? You do have legitimate backups. You rolled a 15, and the backups are live. So you're able to revert back to that backup and, uh, and actually restore operations, uh, which is very, very good. However, we still have the PR fall. Right? We can't get around that at all. So management's got to come up with an approach. How do we actually handle the narrative that there was a fluffy bunny, at least customers thought there was a fluffy bunny on our website uh, for a period of time? Marketing, can we write a fluff piece quick? And post it on Twitter? We're so sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this was totally not our fault. Our I think, DNS I provider. Think in our, the real we situation, were, it was probably much worse than Fluffy Bunny. We were executing maintenance on our server. And <laughs> we can we try to cover it up again? Fluffy Bunny. Yeah, yeah covering it up, that works great. No, covering yeah. up never works. It never, ever Issue works. a direct apology for yeah. temporary compromise? Yes. Yeah. But, but was this actually a compromise? I mean, are you guys going to put the narrative in that way that you were actually compromised? Well, somebody had to get on there and. Well, third party it. was so, compromised. Yes. Yeah, yes, but So really, we're looking at two separate things, right? We have. An acquisition and third party you have assessment. You a third party assessment plan. Because so, our website is hosted by a third party, so we can say that we apologize. It was the third party hosting service that was hacked. We have resolved the so issue. So we, we go to policies and procedures. We have issue. one. Yeah. It's written. We we're are trying. training on how to handle this. We're we're rolled a 15. Yes. So that's good. So that Plus the modifier. Really really one. Plus the modifier. It's spectacular. It. <laughs> it's spectacular. All right. So we go through it. So let's talk about what went wrong in this organization. I think that there's a couple of different things. Um, and this, this incident was actually created to articulate that incidents can happen in such a way that they're outside of an organization's control. So if you have an organization that is able to fax a, a piece of paper that says, uh, please change your DNS records, you can call that whatever you want to your customers, right? But at the end of the day, the customers don't know what DNS is. They have absolutely no idea how this actually plays out. It's all a bunch of technical mumbo jumbo. So what is the issue? And by the way, the DNS thing via fax, I think that that happened with Metasploit. Years and years ago, somebody was able to hijack Metasploit through a fax that was sent in. So if we're looking at it, what do we think went wrong? Let's start with that first one. We'll come back to ASOC the intern, because I think you guys touched on a couple of things that I think were very, very useful. So let's start with the DNS issue. What, what went wrong there? Well, clearly we've uh, authorized too much access uh, to be accepting uh, DNS changes from our provider via fax. Yeah, but is that necessarily your organization's fault? I don't have anything to say. Go ahead. I oh, yeah, you keep I looking at Sierra like, help, <laughs> help. <laughs> I mean, to well, someone said it should be promoted to senior sysadmin, so. Yeah. In a certain aspect, it is. Yeah, we, absolutely. We accepted it. Our third party, we should be limiting access to that as much as possible. Yeah. Only to that exact same thing. We dictated that an assessment be performed on their change management controls, which we have there in place that they okay. missed. So what we're talking about now is more moving forward in the future and the lessons learned. There's no way you guys could do an effective lessons learned without bringing, I guess we're going to make it GoDaddy in the situation, to the table and actually have a conversation with them. Uh, is there some kind of change that could be done on the permissions on the DNS provider? Is there some kind of internal permissions that they need to go through uh, as well? to not just trust faxes as they come in. So really, the lessons learned Everybody is going to require. faxes can be trusted. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way hackers use fax machines. <laughs> it never would work. So I think that that's, that's a good approach for lessons learned. Um, let's talk about what went right. Uh, so what are the procedures that you have in place that seem to be the most helpful to get through this? Um, lots and lots of policies, right? However, let's see. What did we use in this case? 
I've got backup policies for sure. You also had policies for communicating with your DNS provider. I think that that was change management. Yeah, change CM. That that's awesome. Um, also, the initial uh, detection uh, you guys went through and tried to check and see if the web, if the website, whenever you looked at it from multiple different angles, from the people out on the internet seeing a bunny to marketing seeing everything is okay and looking at that from multiple different areas, I think was helpful. It also helped to roll an eighteen on that. I was hoping you guys would let like kind of flounder around a little bit on it. You keep wanting us to flounder, and you keep rolling us high things. I know. So I know. Like I the wonder if that thing's favor. waited. <laughs> it could be. It could be. It could be. By location, GLA. Yeah. Yeah. They're kind of breaking it down by location. So um, now uh, let's talk about it from the uh, from the backup perspective. We had an ASOC, the intern and business inject, walk in, and I think Sierra had it right immediately and was able to actually revert a web server to a snapshot in VMware. What what are some things that went wrong there to allow that intern to actually do that type of activity? Well, ASOC obviously had to have access to infrastructure, which is, in, yeah. in theory, a problem. And that's and that, and that can boil down to physical access, right? Yeah. Um, having too much access. Like our, our uh, server room, you know, you guys locked me out of it because I'm probably the most Dangerous idiot that locked those information. <laughs> Why do you need to go into the knock, John? Well, I, I just want to yeah. so make sure you sign out with the clipboard as we walk you in. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to escort me the whole time. Yes. Um, so that physical access is part of it, right? Um, what else? Uh, what are some other things? We have physical access policies and procedures that need to be reviewed. What What else needs to be reviewed? I think we need to look at the, the intern program as well, make sure that we are putting interns in appropriate uh, positions within the company, yeah. especially when it comes down to the IT area. Yep, yep. Um, now, let's talk about the access to the council. If ESOC, the intern, was able to just use a crash card to access a system and access the virtual machine uh, environment and change things on the fly, what does that, I mean, let's, let's kind of think this through, what does that generally entail did not happen in the NOC? Well, certainly uh, he wasn't attended. Yeah. Uh, he had access to begin with, so it's a whole other issue. So there's two issues there. Um, he had access and he was not attended. So. And this is one of those things we see in physical assessments all the time where you get into a network operations center and they may have great security if you're from a uh, help desk account or an administrator account or a standard user account, but you walk in. And how many times have we walked into Knox and there's a screen just logged in to one of their core servers? No authentication whatsoever. So that's probably another procedure that I think exists. Uh, I saw policies for password policies and lockout policies. But this is clearly one of those areas, yeah, right there. This is clearly one of those areas where that was not enforced. So the IT team was basically not enforcing the policies that were in place as well. And my screen just went quiet. There or Jason says, uh, sorry, um, how about, uh, so it might be something scrolled. Um, how about the organization that apparently has ancient snapshots in VMware? Some yeah. some backup products will even break oh, and just okay. leave them. Boy, there we go. Service accounts change, and there's old snapshots. Just keep them running. Keep them running all the time. Take thousands of snapshots. All the things. Yep. Uh -huh. All right. So you guys, sur you guys survived. So I want to say well done, from cubicles and compromises, and uh, I want to say thanks to everyone for attending. And also with this in mind. I want to leave it open for about uh, 15 minutes and I'm going to monologue. So please start typing your questions now because we won't start getting your questions for another 30 seconds. So the idea of cubicles and compromises is to create a, a kind of a fun way to handle incident response scenarios that you guys can go through them fairly quickly. You guys can literally, if you want, you can steal scenarios from what, some recent breaches that we were joking about. We talked about Uber. We talked about Equifax, right? Like you could recreate that exact incident. Like for Equifax, you can say there's out of date unpatched software on the edge of our environment that an attacker has compromised, what happens next? And you can kind of go through these Marketing scenarios. Marketing says to offer them 20 years of credit reporting. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> so we've learned that we need to offer 20 years of credit monitoring and move our company to South Dakota because there's no breach notification laws uh, in this. I'm going to meet Christy Nome this Thursday. We're all going to meet her, actually. <laughs> we are so in trouble. <laughs> no. Not that she has anything to do with South Dakota laws, but anyway. We're not talking about politics on a website. No, no, no we're not. On. We're not. But I'm so going to get my butt kicked, I'm sure. So uh, the goal of this is to try to come up with scenarios that you can go through quickly. The randomized, uh, the random dice rule, it's basically throwing randomization so the narrative moves forward or it stops. So if you get into a situation where an incident stops immediately, then it's fine. Just start up another incident and keep moving. 
Um, that's great, but you want to keep doing this as practice for the organization. And really, the biggest thing this is going to pull out is lack of procedures and also communication. Um, some things that we've noticed in some of our tabletops, a lot of times we'll have one technical person that's answering all of the time. There's that one person. Like, what would you do? Well, I'd go and I'd pull that system's uh, hard drives and I do forensics analysis. Are you trained? Yeah, I'm trained. You have procedures? Yeah, I got procedures. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And we actually have an inject. If you're doing this as like a dungeon master or an incident master, one of our injects is your lead incident handler has been removed uh, because uh, they, they, his family had a baby um, or he was hit a pandemic. <laughs> they had a pandemic. He got sick <laughs> and he died. And he can no longer answer any questions. And that's cool because if you take that one person that's always answering the questions off the table, it's kind of funny because you start seeing the rest of the group go, hey guys, what would we wow. do? And they all look at that, that IT person and they're like, huh? like, no, he can't answer. And I'll be like, Ooh. and the entire <laughs> incident terrible. goes to hell. Uh, so ah. you can do that as an incident master. Now we have some questions I think that are starting to percolate in. So what I'm, do we have? I would like you to respond, especially to why incident response is an awful Thing for us to do as a company? There's a couple of reasons. It's not necessarily that I hate it. Uh, it basically has to do with we're a pen testing company. And we realized a long time ago that pen testing skills and incident response skills are really two different sets of skills. There are some rare, precious unicorns out there that enjoy incident response and penetration testing. I would probably fall into that category. But by and large, people who like to break into things like to break into things. People like to, to react to incidents also like to just kind of stay in that area. Um, also, it deals with bench depth. Uh, Black Hills Information Security, I think we're up to like 17 or 19 full-time pen testers, and we got a few more other people that can assist as well. And we're booked. Uh, we are completely booked with pen tests. And whenever you work an incident, a lot of the incidents are, um, we want you in Minneapolis in the next 24 hours. And we, we don't have anybody to give for those types of things. So at one point, we had to focus on what we're going to do. And at BHIS, we focused on pen testing and also hunt teams, because hunt teams could be done at our leisure, and it's a little bit less panicky. I would also like to add that we don't like to testify in a court of law. I do. I love do it. You? Yeah, uh, I love it. Bob I says, that's a pity, time. because no one is as good as you. Oh, that's, that's so really nice. Sweet. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, so, but that also gets into another you thing. Be an SMA, you want to be an You want to be on the stand. I can't. Yeah, I love doing that, but I just can't. Yeah. And I can't even work incidents. Um, Derek was doing a lot of forensics investigations for us. And uh, I was doing them as well, but whenever I get involved in a forensics investigation, I'm off the table for like three weeks, and a whole bunch of other things go to hell. So we might do it more that now that CJ's taking that COO role, but honestly, do what we do best, which is breaking into stuff and doing threat hunting and finding advanced adversaries and networks. He's so. just taking that role now. Huh? He's just taking that role now. He's taking it more and more on. Uh, we're it, starting. It's, it's still startup-ish, so we're all yeah, like, we're learning the thing. It's kind of like Kent is a pen tester, a system administrator. Ten years. CIO, hey, you know what I was thinking though? Director of we are celebrating 10 years, but <laughs> most of us have started when it was still really tiny. Yeah. So in a way, like we're still Some growing. As we sure. grow, it still yeah. has that startup feeling. Um, yeah. Mike said, do you have a standard list of incidents and follow-up questions that you use, or at least a starting place for people who want to start doing table talks? Because so many people said this was awesome and they want to try this well, out. And I, I think that this is whatever we were joking about a book. I think we'd write a very small book like the, uh, the Red Team or Field Manual or the Hashcat mm -hmm. Manual, like a really, really small book that's just the scenarios. Because if you ever play Dungeons and Dragons, um, when you go through the games, the Dungeon Master has a full view of absolutely everything, and they have how the narrative is supposed to to move from point to point to point. And then they have specific sections that they're supposed to read out. So I was thinking about actually building that and actually writing like five or six or 10 Okay, scenarios. it's a good idea. I'd probably um, We won't have to do the weird you. formatting. We won't have to do the weird formatting with the pictures and the screenshots, so it'll be a little bit better. Oh, no uh, screenshots. Yeah, so thank God, right? Still my beauty party. Mono space text. Yeah, yeah. All right, so next question. Um, somebody suggested running down Verizon's data breach report for more incident options. And like mm -hmm. we mentioned, the news is a really good option for yeah. uh, scenarios. Didn't they buy a company that's been breached? Who, Verizon? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that one. That's, Wait, that's they've that. been breached? I'm just kidding. Does that mean that Verizon's been? <laughs> I don't know. But I know it did cut their cost <sighs> of buying a Yahoo by quite a bit. So Wait, there's don't submit a resume to BHIS with a at Yahoo.com. Or a dot. Yeah. Doc file. Yeah, don't. Just do it just text. Don't. Copy and paste text. We oh, love the people that send us resumes and it's nothing but text. Like, don't send us a PDF. It's like, no. No. All right, so what else do we have here? 
Um, most of them, others were just comments. We haven't gotten any other questions, really. Um, yeah. Right. It was good. So do you guys like the uh, more live format? We're going to try to figure out how to do the slides a little bit different. It was um, a little fuzzy in quality, so I'm not sure if that's because it's darker in here. It or... also could be the compression that YouTube puts on it, too. Could be. Um, it is wired in, so. We definitely we get YouTube compression, here. not, no, no, not I, ours. I, I, this was okay. a separate thought, Jordan. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I demand 1080p. All right. Um, can we have a plus five modifier for running Rita? Yes, you can. I, oh, wow. okay. Plus ten modifier for running Rita. Actually, we have a test where they're actually firing it up and they're starting to detect yeah. some of the back doors that we're running. And they may have been used as an yeah. example how to operate. Yeah. So, yes, we do have some. Um, and I think for the first time I get to see Rita tomorrow. Uh, not Rita. You can see the full commercial. Oh, I like the AI hunt. Um, we're actually demoing AI hunt. We, I don't want to. You, if you guys don't. Just leave now if you don't want to hear about AI Hunt. Um, but uh, the product Paul and I have been working on uh, with a whole bunch of people at PHIS is uh, at the point where it's done, uh, we have a release and uh, we're going to be demonstrating it to Black Hills Information Security tomorrow because they're wondering what the hell we've been doing for the past two years. So be on the lookout for that. All right, are we ready to wrap this up? Someone asked why the slides weren't on go to webinar. Well, that was John. He wanted the slides to be a surprise for you, so he wanted to paste them. Um, we could try that though. So yeah, actually, we had some positive things on the live format. So yeah. it's just I, I, we're gonna have to play with like AV switchers where you can switch from a camera to uh, to a slide or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. And, I, and I think um, regarding a standard list, no, not exactly. John might have kind of a standard list of incidents and follow up questions that you use at least a start in place for people who want to get started. I would start with a uh, I would start with an email <laughs> like an email spear phishing attack because that's like ninety five percent of the incidents that are out there. Where and, do they start? Absolutely. And then also look at any pen testing class. Like if you look at SANS 560, it has a great progression of how an attack actually goes through. And also, so does SANS 504. I never mind. Um, but you can use that as starting places for different types <laughs> of incidents later. as well. Not later. I really enjoyed um, 504. Yeah. So, John so if you... One of the best if information you, security classes ever. Ever. Full time. So 504. I thought leader. <laughs> Minions. <laughs> oh, employees. Um, I'm buying lunch for all of you. Um, oh, Josh you. did point out that he Is would be Chinese terrified buffet? to see how his company would do with this. And I think one of the Most things that would. makes this really fun yeah. is that it, it brings that kind of scary element that yeah. you need to like show people this is how, like, it's going to be scary and you're not going to know yeah. until I it's think, done. And I think on that first company we did, they thought they had it in line and ready to go. I mean, they, yeah. they come into the meeting confident that, yeah, yeah we're going to rock and it. And it just starts going. <laughs> <down the hill. laughs> now, the other thing that you can do as an incident master that's a lot of fun is you can completely fudge the roles. Um, like, if you feel that, I've actually done that. Shh. Where I want the story to progress, and they're like, "What do we roll?" You rolled a two. <laughs> it's actually like an eighteen. I'm like, "Ah, that sucks." So what now? Oh, well, I guess we'll have to deal with the issue now. Um, so it's kind of cool. All right. So any other questions? Shameless plug. Shameless. We are full of shame. Yeah, we are. All right. Absolutely not shameless. So Thank you so much for joining this format. I think we're going to continue doing it. I liked it a lot. It was really, really cool. And we will see you in the next webcast, which I think is uh, hunt teaming tales from the trenches, right? Like weird things that we found uh, cool. doing hunt teams. Could be. Yeah, there's Could definitely be. stories in there. Yeah. yeah. Some of them are pretty funny. I'll be sending an email. So if you aren't on our email list um, because we did this YouTube live thing, then go to our website and click on contact and then there's a drop down that says sign up and you can sign up for our mailing list so you get my emails. I don't spam you, I promise. It's just about our cool stuff that we're doing. So it's like those YouTube yes. videos that are like, see the button, click subscribe. Click subscribe, please, because it's all about the clicks. <laughs> Marketing won't try to sell you anything. No, I don't. I, I try not to be schmoozy. No, I don't, right? All right. We tried 1080. I don't know what's wrong with YouTube. All right. All right. Bye. See ya. Later, everybody.